Having spent a long time with Rails and with the jQuery framework, when I was first introduced to Meteor, the idea of reactive programming was a little strange to me. In this example, I have a template, and when this variable my name changes, the user interface is updated automatically. In this episode, I want to uncover at least the basics behind how this works. To do that, we'll look at something called a Meteor context. Let's take a quick tour through a Meteor context so that we can understand what it is, and then we'll look at a concrete example. A Meteor context just stores a bunch of callback functions, which can then be called later by calling the invalidate method of the context. Let's add a couple of callback functions to this context. We'll do that by calling the onInvalidate method. It takes one parameter, which is the callback. I'll add one more, which will do the same thing as the first callback, except it will just say second callback. Now if we jump over to the browser and we call the invalidate method on the context, we can see that each one of these callbacks gets called in turn. And then the callbacks are deleted from the callbacks array of the context. And the context is marked as invalid. But where does that invalidate method actually get called? And what causes these callbacks to run? Well, there's another method of context called run. That takes a function as a first parameter, as the only parameter. And it also sets a global context pointer that points to this current context. That way we have access to it from anywhere inside this function or other functions that are called inside this one. So as an example, let's just store it in a variable called current context. And the property that stores that uh, points to the global context is meteor.depths.context.current. And that's set again by calling the run method of the context. So what I can do is just print this out to the console. And then what I'll do is I'll set a timer to invalidate the context at just a later time. So we'll call invalidate. And I'll do that in three seconds from now. So when I save this, we can see over in the browser that we see the current context. And then three seconds later, we, in, we call invalidate on the context, which calls each one of our callbacks and then marks the context as invalid. OK, now that we have a sense of how the Meteor context works, let's look at an actual example where we can use the Meteor context to create a live updating user interface. I'm going to cut and paste some code, which is very straightforward. First, I have uh, an object called my name. And that object has a value and a getter method and a setter method. The getter method just returns the current value and the setter method just sets the value equal to whatever is passed in. Then down below I have a render name function which just gets the current name from the my name object and then using a little jQuery just sets the HTML of the body equal to the name that's returned from my name. And then down here, I'll use the meteor.startup function to wait until the DOM is ready, and then I call the render name method. And as you can see, as soon as I do that, the name is rendered in the DOM over here. So my goal is to be able to update the value of my name and have it reflected in the user interface automatically. And we'll call this reactive programming. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to update the my name object to be a reactive data source. I'm going to create a new property called contexts and set it equal to a new meteor depths context set. A context set is just a collection of contexts that we can store, and it gives us some convenience methods like invalidate all, 
so that we don't have to loop over all of the contexts ourselves. Next, I'm going to go to the get method, and I'm going to keep track of the current context from which we call get so that we can call invalidate and have that code run again if this value changes. So I can call a convenience function on the context object, which is just a context set, called add current context. As we saw earlier, we can get a global pointer to the current context, and all this does is grab that, that current value and add it to our set. Okay, next I'm gonna to go to the set method and first, let me see if the value has actually changed. And if it has, what I'll do is first I'll set the value. And then I'll invalidate all of the contexts. Okay, good. Now we have a reactive data source, but we still need a way for the user interface to update when that data source invalidates its context. So let's come down to the startup code here and change a few things. I'm going to create a method. I'm just going to call it auto render. And the first thing auto render needs to do is to create a new context. The second thing it's going to do is call the run method on that context. And within the callback function, it's going to just call render name. And remember that when we call run on, the, on a context object, what it does is set a global context pointer so that within render name, when we call myName.get, the myName data source has a chance to store this context and invalidate it later. And now down here, what I'm going to do is add a callback to the on in, uh, by calling the on invalidate method. And on invalidate, I'm just going to run this entire method again. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is call auto render for the first time. And if I come over to the browser and I see my uh, name has been rendered properly, but if I call set on my name, Great, I've now got a reactive user interface. But it turns out there's a better way to do this. Meteor provides a convenience function called auto run that does all of this exact same thing. So we don't have to write this code over and over again. Instead, we just call meteor.auto run and pass in the name of the method. When the code reloads, we'll just make sure that it still works. And it does. The Meteor dependency package is really cool and allows us to write an entirely new style of code that I think will save a ton of time in writing even regular applications. If you want to learn more about the depths package, you can go to the Meteor docs themselves at docs.meteor.com, scroll down to the meteor.depth section, and you can read about the methods that we just looked at.